Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to tonight's broadside reading. Um, my name is Caroline Wood. I'm the Educational Programs Manager here at Center for Book Arts. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are an un ancestral unceded territory of the Nihonabe people. Tonight, we present Seeing the Stars When the Sun is Shining, Fall 2022 Broadside Reading, number two, curated by Emily Grant. This reading is part of a series that has been going on for more than 20 years. There's an echo. I think it's because um, you have the sound off. I think it's okay. It's okay. Okay, going back to where I was. Um, so, so this series has been going on for 20 years. Um, and it gives opportunities to visual artists and poets to work together. So Emily Brandt, she, they, is the author of the poetry collection Falsehood, as well as three chapbooks. She's a co-founding editor of No Gear, curator of the Lineage Reading Series at Wendy Subway, and member of the video art collective Temp Files. I'd like to also thank our funders. This pro program is supported by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts, the NYC Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, poets and writers. And I'd also like to thank everyone who's donated to support this event, and also folks who brought, bought the broadsides. Um, I'd also like to say the broadsides are um, for sale tonight. So if you'd like to buy them, we have them available. Um, they are signed, which is exciting. And that is all I have as far as introductions. Um, real quick, I do want to mention that we are um, hosting several events next week. Um, so please come to our, come to our events. Um, we have a, um, a film screening on Wednesday, a virtual book talk on Monday, um, and another book launch on Friday. So keep an eye out for our, for our website again. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Emily, who will take it from here. Um, I will go ahead and just leave uh, the notes up here. So. Thank you all for being here in this space together and to anyone who is watching at home. Um, I'm Emily and it was my honor to curate this fall's broadside series. I want to thank especially Camilo and Elspeth for inviting me and to Caroline and Liz for supporting the series um, and to all of the poets and artists who will introduce as we go. Um, the title for the series, Seeing the Stars When the Sun is Shining, comes from translation from Patanjali Sutras. And for me, it's exciting because I've been thinking and writing through for many years about the relationship between unconsciousness and consciousness and um, like integrating many practices into my creative and personal life that, that deal with both trying to see more clearly the unconscious mind and then also work with it consciously. Um, and I think that artists are often doing that as well, whether they're naming that process or not. And so it was really exciting to make that explicit and to invite poets to send work that is dealing with that on some level. And the work really had so many different interpretations of this concept from thinking about um, the power of giving voice to feeling thinking about um, mem what, we, what is remembered versus what is forgotten, intentional silences, intentional sex acts, and many other uh, forms of ritual, forms of prayer, forms of sacrifice, and lots of these other practices that you'll see in the six poems in the series. Um, and so as you're listening to the poets read, you might keep this in your mind and just see what resonates for you and perhaps where you connect in to the idea of trying to access those things that are perhaps driving us that we aren't always aware of. Um, so to begin, I'm going to introduce um, Imogen Christian Smith, and her work is here. That was uh, the art is done by Eddie Perote, who I don't think is here right now. So Imogen will be reading, and. They are a poet and performer living in Lenape Hoping, Brooklyn. Their work has appeared in Based, Lush, Folder, The Rumpus, The Poetry Project Newsletter, and Tag Burke, among others, as well as in We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics. A 
2021 to 22 Emerge Surface B Fellow at the Poetry Project. Imogen's debut collection, STEMI Things, is out from Nightbook Books. Welcome, Imogen. Hello, thanks Emily. Um, it's really nice to be here. Yeah, I think Eddie is not here, but um, I'm really grateful, Eddie, if you're watching. <laughs> really great to see you. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my new book. It's called Stimmy Things. And, uh, and then I'm going to read some new poems from a new manuscript of which this is an excerpt. Can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> this is called Metamorphosis. A fish drowns easily in air. The body is syntax is flat. I am nothing if not earnest, earthy, a woman spreading ash over prayed upon stone sleeves of carnations to mentor their tears. I have huddled in walk-ups, quarantined with fear, unwilling to love myself careless enough, reckless with joy or respite for the world. Yet here is my softness outstretched, my sourness born through reams of abrasion, corridors of unkempt rooms and the dull strewn flop of minds, a sweet metallic tinge for all the body's depostured openings. It's hungry loops and formal arches, trembling spasms of yes. I grow verdant with run-ons and tiny breasts jutting north like haunted mountains. Sometimes I'm woman, all gibbous, pearl and jazz, languidly unfixed beneath muslin skies, gathering secrets and mouthy eaves. To others, I'm always fish. So upended, I hardly manage flapping. Body of peel of misconnections, thirsty for seconds. The prick of desire fingers my ridges, flip flops atop a belly, gurgling Delphic till the drip spills out like sloppy erection. I wonder a dreamland of estrogens, turn from one sort of birth toward other possibilities, bruised and sparkling like a vein of stars. Sea flush stripped of grammar, Ontologies of faggots and borrowed gowns spun glitter with vibing smoke. I am a person full of doubt and mirth. My heart tonguing envelopes care of you, you, and you. A wardrobe of further interiors, vermilion with angst, verse, smut, sex remixed and sprigging tendrils down toppled walls. Nothing about the body is short of miraculous. Think cream cradled hollows or sleeping skin to skin. Think lemon trees that bloom with fruit or the line in a poem where certainty breaks. Next poem. Um, I'm actually not reading them in an order that I suggested at before. Um, not that it matters, but this is called Lingua Expo. It's about my general confusion over what language is and like where in the body a word sort of comes from before it exits. Language as verb and attribute of animal, something all things do. A gesture here, some chirping there, radar bat and discreet fin of whale, photosyntho leaf speak, horse drop a tone, now raise it up crying and crying, I'm public, I'm crying. Let me start that up. Language is verb and attribute of animal, something all things do. A gesture here, some chirping there, radar bat and discreet fin of whale, photo sent though leaf speak, horse drop a tone, now raise it up crying and crying in public, I'm crying, collective whimpers, sobbing Alexandria's voluminous movement and communique beneath the sun. However we come and come together, it is in a language place. Words among many means of inciting directionality by exhaling sound and pointing at things. 
the basic unit is always breath, tether, tether, mother to the everything. Differentiation follows suit, outlines your daily somatic, sense perceptions, feelings, envies, attachments, flares, aches, breakouts of the awful letting goes, mourning pain and jealousies, loathe, lust, musk and fuck, sex and sexes, sexualities, adjacent this and that, all possible BPMs, but it's four on the floor, go bonkers, lick and stench, any subtle shift in arbitrary metrics of pressure. Novel feelings resonate, thus new ways to language emerge. Shock of water on a shaved head. Friends of your gone glass needle, done. Plague stays, won't you come closer, come closer, it's been so long. Testing bands, hauntings, movie nights, play party, reveries, great sun, diner, hours, talking, night one on hormones, spun loop cheese, soft up, quick month up, month nine, year one, stoned. Summer ends, the sun is setting. Leave it no longer lovers in bits, wondering where on earth does tenderness go. It goes flip-flop, acquiesce to spirit mood. Lacking words, just go on feeling and wait. In the beginning, there were words, and the words named God and set all things in relation, hence different sense translation. The word creates nothing but specifies its bearer thus. It really fucks with me how Krishna Murthy asks, can you see the tree and not see the word? I mean, come on. This poem takes God as noun and respeaks it as borderless compersion, but don't laugh. It's here for the here always, the almost not quite, but on my way, JK never was before and after, maybe. Hope has a language the spider leaves and what's kept, droplets, dead things, all this context and heavy bass laying tone for inscription, parts of the body you're scared to. Recall that words are elastic, one dries, another shifts, and the ocean inhales what's new, spits it right back out. Lacking one language, you just go on feeling, let emotion make the words. Language doesn't fail to express the feeling. The feeling is its own language. Not everything is speech domain. Sometimes you shake your body night up to day. Sometimes you draw a little picture or racket noise for play using just the tools you have. But here's the thing. Everything is always speaking. I slip into ocean and water surrounds me. My skin responds, my senses language and I hear, though it's not a sound. As I feel new feels, I speak new tongues, key to knowing, but not the knowing itself. It's the body's relation to say shudder or subspace, oval ecstasy in a body shaking loose, symbols, weird connections. Formal thing hovering to talk to me. Okay, next I'm gonna find, oh, here it is. This is the poem that the broadside is an excerpt from. It's called Attention. And um, it's a quasi concrete poem. So it's sort of like hard to read it. It's not really like a performance piece, but um, Let's see what to say about it. What I will say is that I wrote it in one sitting in an afternoon in August. And it was one of those experiences where you're making something and you're like at the very edge of what your capacities are or what you feel your capacities are. And then you feel yourself go over that edge and it doesn't always happen, you know? And sometimes you make things and you finish them and you never had that moment and that's fine. Not everything needs to like sort of push you and like make you grow um, uh, adjacently to the making of it. But this one really did, so it's special to me. And I'm really glad that Eddie chose the part that he did. Okay, it's called Attention. Seated to poem, an act of devotion to the material world. In silence, I am eternal, be perturbed. Even the dumb shit is sacred. Word, my feelings become public, something I said. Space, the future form beyond positivisms. Here I can surrender to the movements of my life, 
finding the whole underlying constant fragmentation. I give prayer with attention to the movements of life. East, West, North, South, material world, precise play and hot fucking attention to the tissues, the bones, to the nervous system, brain and blood vessel sure, to every house, every parcel, every bite, desire upon more and more and more. And there is mystery I sense all about me that is everything plus. In space, there are fragments, sentences, dizzy smut, language, and those languages trans. My feelings become public, an act of devotion to the material world. Prayer hears everything ineffable the body seems already to know. It won't shift your breakings, make poems or hours hospitable. Positivity has its place, but the nervous system can't always finagle. This is, this is the page. Wheeling and dealing, wheeling and dealing. On the wheel, you've been harassed, followed, outlawed slow by the by and by. There's a hopeless hope you'll hold work that feeds relationships more stable than moves than my New York City roof succumbing to August rain, swells violent and more affluent each season. No crescendo, birthright, destiny, only body, moments of envy what others leave. Fish flap, love sex cleaving, rainbow muck, center stage, Iwanis canal. <coughs> I reach for surrender with flailing motions beyond stated boundaries. Police thing, incarceration, red lines, colonization, mechanics of gender, norms of devotion, Mothering rich boys, seats to govern, climate, class wars, borders, and puritanical seals. Hear world humming, try and move with the sound. Earth hem, geologic, words congeal, languages as bones are, vessels holding. I sit down to poem and it's civic, something I can return to this shitty, shitty place. A chip of economy, social. We people hold our bodies and their languages, their grievances, lamentations and demands, talking affect, pleasure, pain and fragmentations, edging easily and en masse through the eyes of big stupid needles. I am compelled to be here. All I do is listen holding with time allotted whatever I can come to know. Listening is active attention. Attention has active love. Attention, love, beyond the intellectual. Maestros, composers of all things. I bring my body here, spread across pages, lick the cream, what's up? This material animated within us deep, endless, ineffable realms of desire for which we might scrawl flesh words with awe into extremes. I flirt with you openly, an act of devotion. You might slide me some chips of truth, not about humans, but an expansion of what becomes, intuition, a perception, how we reach out through breath, implying body, implying motion, using language when all the while we can surrender, play with attention. I'm gonna read two more from the book, Stemmy Things, which I have a few copies if anyone would like one. It's, real, it's weird reading from a book of like, what are in fact other poems. Find, trying to find some sort of new life in them. Such a sad problem. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to read two the first and the last. 
This is called deep ecology. Gardens are for growing stemmy things bending towards sun. We living sink heirloom in tidy rows, set away days to brush clean the stone, lay leaves that unfurl slow. Nothing is ever finished. We are naked, relentless, a now hard, now molten presence. Some call this horror, others beauty, elemental, I say, pieced together of skies generous weeping. It's fair to wonder how earth holds our wreckage, why we aren't swallowed in the belly of, though some questions answer themselves. You cannot swap a set of bones, nor come from any other ruined man. We gather days, dust, brick, bacteria, mortar, form, consequence gives a body shape, says you cannot build moment alive. I am not a woman. My gender is feminine. Even the moon travels farther for what it wants. Mostly I'm water, swollen, mourning, tie a blue ribbon around my finger and forget me. Do you think me monstrous wanting my body my way? My poem is a dream saying, teach me where you're brittle and maybe we can rest there. Her breath tethered limbs to toes wrapped blue mid where nothing alone is useful. Deep in the quiet, I touch myself undone. Stars, still stars over turns and brambles, a dark wood weaving beyond city light. You love the mess, don't you? The way consequence gives and gives, stony dismay, a sweetness of rest. Here's a poem for my body, stemmy thing, begins and ends in dirt. And this is called Wound Vision. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah, Eddie, thank you for this. The boss bitch is not my sister, not the nation, and she ain't my mother. I say I'm a traveler, not a conqueror, nor am I passive either. There are bodies yearning inside me and we vibe. At the secret rave in Prospect Dark, the dancing's erratic, post so much sick. We take prop, we take poppers off preppy gays who have before time sneered at my holy repurposed talk. Imagine utopia, disability in forms. I like to come off loose and unsettled, as if counter narratives negate all complicit. Like doesn't everyone like doesn't everyone want these drugs, these kinks, these particular beats and wood? A vision is just that, whoever's and yours and y'all talk. I fuck myself often as body allows, deep as I can and a little plus. The erotic's a channel to what I know I don't yet know. Shy inside, bend me over, help me understand anything. If utopia is ecological, speech acts sewn and spun. What will we squeeze from the gut rot of capital? You see, a wound is just that. It's a vision, a Ziploc full of mangoes from a woman in the tunnel. Subway, she, elder, the total ecstasy of fruit in summer, the pleasures of juice stick fingers to tongue. A poem says, look up, look sideways, see the web laid fierce. Yes, I'm naive and a poem is anything. Try quiet or talk all the time, who cares? Herbert Von King in COVID summer, babes at a distance, squat in the bush, weeds played ballpark all a league of their own, and small things get you over. Take Holy Mother Sylvia's big plush bear or every pick of pups in Arco. Take Beverly Glen Copeland any morning, donning my paint splatter Malcolm X bets. I wear lockets and smocks and denim on wool, tie-dye with rhinestone or hoops. Crushes, sweet crushes, erotics of snuggles scribbled in spiral, all caps like Juliana Huxtable. Sometimes pop songs jet me out of time, but mostly reify it. Oh, nostalgia, dreary of cards. Here is the life I've lived. Cup, coin, staff, sword, the dog doesn't fall, it's the fool. A wound friend is just that. In the city, I hear everything. Bye.
I lift what's mine to hold. Out in the street, an I joins we, and we march, shout, crouch, and lock arms, you, 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 and you, intifada, intifada, clap, 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 caps again like June Jordan, and the voice in my throat goes gravel, set to gut by blood-bound ancestors traipsing where they should not go. Me, I'm pavement, step, step, step over stolen ground. Hello. I don't think the world lets people be good. And so we do what we do. We do it here in the world. Thanks. Thank you so much, Imogen. And I'm so sorry because I flipped the order. And when you said even the dumb shit is sacred, that really resonated with um, the moment I was having about that. Um, it's the most sacred. The most sacred. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read Christine Chan Chan Howe's poem because they can't be here. Yes, this is why I flipped the order because your name is first. Um, Farida, can you pass me one of the dots I turned behind you? And then Farida, who I'll introduce in a moment, will speak a little bit about the making of the, of the rough side. So Christine's poem, Playdate, reads, what concerns the mother the most is the concept of shame. You cannot remold the old, she told me. So their shame becomes your child's shame, like teeth marks on the brain. God, I don't know why I spend so much effort giving to you when I barely have time to feel the sun and the moon never casts its light on my shadowy grasses. The situations involving couples in which one half is a poet, my curiosity becomes deviant and sexual in nature. I imagine having sex with them and all of their friends in an open field of poppies, their genitals flowering in the meadowy hills, their dutiful wails of ecstasy. So this broadside was created by um, Christine Shantan House, and the broadside is created by Farida Mareb, who's a Venezuelan artist, award-winning book designer, teacher, researcher, and founder of publishing house Ediciones Letra Muerta. She currently lives in New York City with her husband, where she teaches and designs. Mareb is a visiting scholar at Columbia University, exploring North and South America's hybridity through its printing and book history. So awesome. She's exhibited at Center for Book Arts and is currently co-curating a show in Washington Project for the Arts. So welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to work with Christine's text. Um, one of the reasons I chose this poem out of the three was because it was the most um, rare in, in its structure. Out of all the poems I read of Christine's work, this stood out to me from the length of the verses to the nature of the content. And um, the subject of the poem talks about it's also um, in a way from my perspective associated with, with loss. Um, one of the things that CBA told me they invited me was that the poet had a say through their poetry, but as an artist I I had um, the liberty to interpret that according to my personal experience as well. Um, and to me the poem talking to Christine as well, uh, was not only about being a mother to their daughter, but also being a daughter to their mother. mother. So the different roles of, of us in society. Um, so I wanted to represent something that was quite playful. I, uh, they sent me photos from um, day to day and the photos 
some of the photos were in a playground. So I associated the circular with not only um, the maternal, but also uh, the basic shapes as in children's toys or in playgrounds. And um, one of the things that I wanted was that while they read the poem, that's printed on the back side of the broadside for the audience to be able to see their face through the whole kind of like a paper theater or a kamishibai. Um, I used French paper as a substract. One side was printed letterpress um, and the back side was printed rizzo and the inside the hole was cut with laser. So one thing that I was talking to Christine that I think they also really liked was while I was cutting on the laser, I noticed that the circles were so beautiful because they did leave something empty, a hole, but they also created something else. So I decided to cut holes in the circles that were left behind. And I made masks. So since the poem also depicts certain aspects of their daughter, I wanted to later have maybe in another instance a collaboration where we can make masks with kids. So in that way, the broadside acquires new meaning as mother, a daughter, as daughter. And that's about it. Thank you. So cool to hear about that process. Um, so our final reader is Sophia Jama, and um, their work here was created by Leslie Lassiter, who I don't believe is here. Um, so Sophia, sorry, Sophia, was born to a Somali father and an Irish American mother in Queens, New York. Have a graduate fellow. She has published poetry in Plowshares, Boston Review, World Literature Today, Spoken Black Girl, and Poem a Day. Her poetry has also been featured on WNYC's Morning Edition and CUNY TV's Shades of US series. Jama was a semi-finalist in the Pleiades Press Editor's Prize for Poetry, and she's the author of Notes on Resilience, included in the New Generation African Poets chapbook box set from Akashic Books. And welcome to you. Uh, thank you all for, for coming out on a rainy night. Um, and it's an honor just to be part of this series. Um, and I thought I would start, also shout out to a couple of my students who, who are here. Um, yeah, hey students. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read a medley of poems and I thought I would just start by reading um, Off the Wall, if that's okay. I promise to block the camera, just kidding. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna read it right off the wall. Uh, thank you, Leslie for the design. We had a great chat and I'm really thrilled with, with uh, her vision, their vision. Um, so here we go. It's called Goodbye Horses. I've never done this before reading off the wall, but I thought it'd be fun. Forgive the long silence. I haven't been well all winter. Forget my advice. All of it. I'm no wiser than when I was a child running from other boys. I can still feel the press of their boots against my temple. This wooden chair is an heirloom I burn. Yet another aunt I never met. I wanted to be a good soldier. I envied you. Soon, this house will be empty as a bird house. This house is yours. 
Leslie told me that uh, these belts around the perimeter are actually horse bells, uh, which I found to be like delight in my imagination. Um, these horse bells. So thank you. So um, I think I'd like to read uh, a couple of poems from a, a new book that um, I haven't formally announced yet, but it will be a book next fall um, out with Beltway Editions, a new press uh, based in DC. And uh, so I'm going to start by reading a couple of poems from that. So this is my actual copy of World Literature Today. Um, this poem is called Wedding Day. And the first line actually comes from uh, another poet who's not me. <laughs> Wedding day. There should have been roses. Instead, I clutched red and white carnations my aunt bought from a street vendor outside the courthouse. I should have invited a few friends, had a party after, but such things aren't possible when one secret marries another. We got married at 9 a.m. on a Monday. My aunt cried the whole way down to New York on the I-95 to watch her niece marry a stranger. People I'd known all my life had let me down too often. I'm a gambler at heart, and I slapped my heart down on the green table my father called from, was it Abu Dhabi? Do you two realize what you're getting into? I'm a philosopher at heart. This was my big moment. How can we know? How does anyone know? So this is a, a longer poem that I'm going to share. Uh, I may not read every single word of it. I'll save a little to be mysterious for, for when the book comes out. Um, but it's called Diasporas. And uh, I actually wrote it prior to the election of that other president, you know. Um, who we, who I won't name him. Um, and yeah, I had a lot sort of churning inside of me at the time. So I wrote, wrote this poem. Wow. Diasporas. I grew up in a place called Parkway Village, built for the first employees of the United Nations. People always want to know, so I'll tell you. Yes, my father worked for the UN. At the village entrance, a sign reads, a colonial village of distinctive charm. I have no idea when they put up that sign. Everyone in my immediate family loves Frank McCourt. At a book signing, my mother told Frank she married a Somali nomad. Must make for interesting pillow talk, said Frank. My mother says dad could write the Somali version of Angela's ashes, what with all the hardship he suffered. She says his childhood was Dickensian. My father was born to nomadic pastoralists near the Somali Ethiopian border. My father does not know his birthday. I asked and he said he was born some summer a British civil servant gave him a fake birthday, making him a year older than he likely was. So he could become a third grade teacher at age 12. I decided he must be a cancer. Then again, he might be a Leo. He remembers lions from his childhood. I once saw a traditional Somali akal at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. 
in Somaliland, we visited our driver's village and I saw his family's uncle. And there was blue plastic tarp on top of the sticks and animal hide. Shortly before we left, a hard of hearing boy tried to touch my face. My mother said, it's time to go. This year, I packed a pink suitcase and went off wandering. I made it to Paris, New Orleans, and Sunset Park. My father was sick. In the early 90s, my cousin Abdi left a refugee camp and somehow made it to our home in Queens. He didn't stay with us long. My mother took us clothes shopping on Jamaica Avenue. She kept saying, he's just a skeleton. One day, Abdi got lost and disorientated in the subway. He exited the turnstile and then re-entered through the gate. Two men in plain clothes tackled him to the ground. He fought back. He didn't believe their badges. My father went to get my cousin out of jail. He thought they were trying to rob him. I felt a terrible guilt. Had I left Abdi alone that day somewhere in the city? In high school, I didn't have the words for what I felt. I did my homework and joined the track team. I spent 10 hours each Saturday writing my English essay. 750 to 1,000 words on Hamlet, for example. I was slow, but could tolerate pain. I ran the 800. Once I won the bronze medal at Randall's Island. Curtis cheered me on and afterwards said, nice kick. I felt good that day in my champion bicycle shorts. I'll pause there. It goes on a little longer. I'm going to read one poem from the chapbook, which was part of the New Generation African Poets box set series. Uh, very honored to be part of that series. This is a pandemic book, so 2020, right? It got delayed, you know, somewhere in China, and, uh, but eventually we got we got the books. So here we go. Uh, this is a poem called Lies. And it has an epigraph by the late Chinese poet um, Leo Saobo. Lies. Cloud was the name of my great horse. I collect doll houses. I stand to inherit an igloo and my mother's old polar bear collection. I harbor all the melting ice caps in my mouth. Sea lions hide from the polar bears in my cavities. My baby teeth ruin white gold, which is to say yellow. I'm a sculptor at heart. I'm big in Singapore. In the third grade, I sculpted a life-size woolly mammoth out of melted down wedding bands. These days, I make swans from tin foil that once wrapped the cheese sandwiches mother made. I never loved you. All the polar bears are crying because you are so beautiful and warm. They say it's killing them. All the seals are synchronized swimming again, like sad old ladies in frilly bathing caps. My grandma nicknamed me Lemonade because I was yellow and ridged and buttery as popcorn in that yellow sweater. 12 years of ballet and my pet sea lion lived to be 107. She never ever died. No one ever dies. So I'm gonna just read uh, an old poem. Uh, how am I on time? Yeah, okay. I, you know, I love just digging through 
folders, you know, before I do a reading and uh, seeing what bubbles up out of the deep. <laughs> so I have a couple of real old, old poems I thought would be fun. And then I'm gonna end with uh, a brand new poem because those are also fun. So uh, I'll just read one of the oldie, oldie poems. Uh, I used to go to summer camp when I was a kid. And it, so my childhood is like divided between normal life and then like camp life. And it was very <laughs> intense. And I had like an alternate identity as a camper. Um, but I used to like to hang out in the nurse's office when I first got to camp because I was tired of being a little girl, you know? <laughs> um, so this is called Camper's Lullaby. And it was in New Hampshire. Oh, let me lie quietly in this infinity of matchbook mattresses and plastic coated odors. We'll drink red juice and Dixie cups, all waxy with want and eat bright red pills to quell a fever in mid-July, some mystery illness that fells the horses mid-gallop in your imaginary mind. Oh, soft curls of Mrs. Baker, who's not actually married, though we called her Mrs. because she is our camp nurse who speaks in soft gurgle bubbles and takes us to church in Keene when we want ice cream badly enough. Her kind, soft words bubble up against the glass sides of every sick child. We are eight and nine and 10 year old mermaids on furlough from girlhood. We skinny dip at dawn after a sleepless night in the lean-to by that little step puddle of a pond at the end of the lake path at the bottom of the hill. We, we swim breathless and restless and cleanish across a pond we call the lake. And some of us will contract ear infections later this week. But tonight we will sleep a sound sleep in the shaded room smelling of wax and iodine and bug juice forever would be just fine. Oh, but we can't stay, nor can we say when our fever will break or whether a girl will ever capture the flag, though some of us will hang out inside the ring of yellow rope known as the jail. Some girls will make some marshmallow mistake, capsizing into the fire, carbonizing sugar, stringy as the fire's kindling. They name the littlest ones foxes, and at the end of the summer, the foxes die. But oh, we will not waste a single bone. We'll feed them like crusts to the pigs. We will waste nothing. So I was reading that, I was like, wow, really? That's how I ended the poem, okay. <laughs> yeah, you were fierce. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to end with just a brand new poem that I wrote. Uh, I, I recently took over a class uh, at one of the places where I teach, um, and I was thinking about trust and how to kind of win, the, how we win people's trust over. So thank you for listening. Trust. Say you swallow a chicken bone. Whoops, you think. Then you begin to worry. Then you decide to not worry. Trust your gut, your throat, your inner wisdom that knows what to do with stray chicken bones when picking a carcass clean and soup is boiling on the stove. The fridge is full of bones I've kept since the start of summer. I almost added them to the soup and then thought, wait, Wait until winter when worry sets in like a chill you can't quite shake. That's when you boil the bones, the summer bones. Next, I'm thinking of those far side cartoons about dog husbands opening up their sandwiches like the pages of a book. There lies one solitary chicken bone and the caption reads, she's trying to kill me. And the Mrs. Dog wearing an apron and cat eye glasses stares blankly ahead from her place in the kitchen. 
I can feel that chicken bone moving down my throat. I hope it's small enough to survive the peristalsis. And then I think of snakes and those fishing birds that swallow thrashing fins and teeth and sharp scales. The egg timer dings. My noodles are done. I'll warm a slice of bread. Maybe that will absorb the bone. How did this happen? I've never done this before. Now my life is divided in two, before bone, after bone, BB, AB. Earlier, I took a walk with my vegan friend. The cashier was a little afraid of her. Is it vegan? No, said the cashier. Really? What's in it? multi grit bread, avocado, sounds good. Oh, okay. Next, I think of the people who raised me. They didn't overpromise. Instead, they said, watch out for bones. Thank you. Imogen and Sophia for reading, and Farida for speaking, and to Eddie and Leslie and Christine for being here, um, and to Karen and to Liz. And really just thank you to all of you for being here together. Have a great Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Yeah, um, while I'm up here, uh, their broadsides for sale. Thank you all again so much for coming. Um, thank you to all of our readers and everyone for curating. And feel free to stick around and chat for a little bit. And uh, let us know if you have any questions about Center for Bookers. And I'll, I'll end the live stream. <laughs>